reading of God's word. Today's word will be found in Ruth 4, 1 through 4. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, Turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, Buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know, for there is no one beside you to redeem it. And I come after you, and he said, I will redeem it. You may sit down. Thank you. Father, we come to you as the source of life, the source of all that is good, the source of everything that we are and everything that we need to be. It is you who provides all of it. And so we ask you now as we're endeavoring to engage in something that is deeply spiritual. In other words, Lord, it's beyond just simply the words that are coming out of my mouth or, the, or what our eyes might see as we put our eyes on the Bible. This morning, we are endeavoring to have something happen, Lord, in our hearts. We need you, God. We are desperate for you to move in our midst as we read your word, whether it's um, the, the, the simplest or the most complex of sermons or topics, God, what we need is your, 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 your light to shine into the depths and into the darkness of our own hearts. We need you to open our eyes. I need you. And we need you. We ask you to move in our midst now this morning. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, if I haven't had the chance to meet you yet, my name is Pastor JD, I'm one of the pastors here. And we are working, we are actually in our last sermon of the what we call the school year. We started at the beginning of the school year in the book of Joshua. We have worked our way through the books of Joshua, Judges, and now we will finish up Ruth today. Let me just give you a couple sentences on what is coming for us over the summer. We will be doing a summer series this summer on the doctrines of the faith. And what the doctrines of the faith are is that's a, that's a way, it's sort of a fancy way of saying that we're going to be hitting on the topics that sort of form the foundational elements of the Christian faith. Questions like who is God? Who is Jesus? Who is the Holy Spirit? What has Jesus accomplished for us? What is the church? There are all kinds of questions that we are going to be answering, sort of similar to what you might see if you come week in, week out in a New City Catechism. But we're going to be hitting on those questions, some of those questions, in sermon form. So we'll be going to, to texts and to places in the Bible where that, where that is taught, and we'll be working through those things because I believe— that we as a church, it is good for us to come back to those foundational doctrinal truths, those things that, that we build everything else off, off of. In fact, we should be building our lives off of these foundational truths. And so I'm looking forward to this summer spending time in the doctrines of the faith with you guys. And so that'll be next, uh, starting next week. We will actually start in on that, and uh, we will be doing that throughout the summer. But for this morning, we, were, we are finishing our study of the book of Ruth. And I want to just take us back and give us a, for anybody that's just joining us or has never read the book of Ruth before, I want to give you just a couple of bullet points to sort of orient you as to where we've been and where we'll, we'll be picking up from when we come to our sermon this morning. Ruth and Naomi are both widows that, were, that are now living in Israel. Ruth was a Moabite woman, but Naomi is the wife of an Israelite man named Elimelech who, who died. 
the story goes like this. Elimelech and his, and his um, family, Elimelech, Naomi, and his family once left Israel because there was a famine in the land. There was not enough food. They, they went to a, a, a country that's outside of Israel called Moab. They believed that there was food there. It turns out that while they were in Moab, both Elimelech, the sort of patriarch of the family, and his sons died. But before that, his sons had married two women. One of them was named Ruth, and the other was named Orpah. Naomi, who is now a widow, she was the wife of Elimelech, decides, I'm going to go back to Israel because I believe that there's actually food back there for us. The Lord has, has blessed Israel. So she decides to go back, and she tells her two daughters-in-law to just go back to your country, go back to Moab, go back to your family and your people. Orpah listens to her and leaves. But Ruth, in this sort of famous passage in chapter one, it says, clings to her. And she says that famous line that maybe you've heard before in the Bible, where you go, I will go, where you die, I will die, your God will be my God. And basically Ruth says, I'm coming back to Israel with you. And there's nothing that Naomi can say to dissuade her from doing so. So they come back. Now, when they come back, they are poor and they are destitute. They are widows, which in that society, if you don't, if you don't, if there was no husband to care for you, you were, you could die of starvation, right? And so there's a desperate situation that's going on here. She goes back. And they decide to do something that the poor would do at that time is to go behind the in the fields as the harvesters are going through and harvesting the, the grain in the fields. The poor would walk behind the harvesters and sort of pick up the scraps. In fact, God told the harvesters. Do not harvest everything. Leave scraps. Leave the edges of your field. And if you drop something on the floor, do not pick it up. So it was kind of an anti-efficiency law that God said because the poor would wander behind. And so Ruth now finds herself wandering behind the harvesters in a field. And it just so happens that that field belongs to a man named Boaz. Boaz treats Ruth very, very kindly. And he says, you can stay in my field as long as you want. In fact, let me sort of help you to make sure that you can gather all that you need. And Ruth leaves that field with two weeks worth of food. One day, she, works, she leaves that field with two weeks worth of food. She comes back to Naomi and Naomi goes, where did you get this? Where did you get this much food from a field? Who lets you do this? She says, well, I was in the field of a man named Boaz. And Naomi recognizes that name. She says, Boaz is one of our family. He's one of our distant family relatives. So then the next chapter, Naomi decides to tell Ruth, look, you're going to go and meet Boaz and you're going to actually be a little bit forward with him. And you're going to basically say to him, look, you're a redeemer in our family. Will you actually redeem me? Essentially what Ruth is doing in chapter three is she is asking Boaz to marry her. And to take her and Naomi on and to care for them and provide for them as a husband to Ruth. And then Naomi would be brought in and be cared for as well as sort of a mother-in-law in that process. And so we have this tense moment, and we saw it last week in chapter three, where we don't know what Boaz is going to do. Ruth is taking very, very high societal risk in coming to Boaz as this potential redeemer. We don't know what's going to take place. And then the tension breaks as Boaz recognizes her, sees what she's doing and responds positively and says, I will help you. I'm going to redeem you. Basically, he says, I'm willing to marry you. And we, we, we basically get to this point of resolution, but not all of the problems have been solved yet. Because, and you can pick up with me now in chapter 3, verse 12, if you have your Bibles open. Here is Boaz's amazing response to Ruth as she meets him in the, in the fields at night. Boaz says to her in chapter 3, verse 12, and now it is true that I am a redeemer. In other words, I'm part of your family. I'm one of those ones that can marry you and redeem you. Yet, 
There is a redeemer nearer than I. Okay, there's, there's somebody else that exists out there who is a closer relative to you and has the first rights to this whole thing. He tells her, remain tonight and in the morning. If he will redeem you, good, let him do it. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until morning. So we're left at the end of chapter three with this sense of, okay, all is well. Boaz has responded favorably to Ruth, but we still don't know if Boaz legally can actually marry her because there were strict laws and culture at that in, in customs at that time about the order in which this sort of thing went. And there was someone in line ahead of Boaz. So we're left with this problem hanging as we now move in to chapter four. So I want to give you guys the main point this morning, and then we're going to move right into chapter four, and we're going to see that main point as it develops. Here's the main point if you're taking notes. False redeemers care ultimately for themselves. The true redeemer acted selflessly to bring peace to you. So we're going to be looking at this comparison contrast, if you will, between a false redeemer and what is a false redeemer and the true redeemer in our story. And I'm going to give it away. Our true redeemer in our story is pointing to a truer redeemer still. And that's where we're going. Let's look at our text again. Ruth chapter four, verses one through four. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the Redeemer, of whom Boaz had spoken, came by. So Boaz said, turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Now, what Boaz is doing at this point is he's conducting sort of a formal legal business transaction. Okay, so in, in, in those days, business transactions would be done in the gate of the city, and they would be done with the city elders. Sort of these are the, the, the wisest, maybe the oldest men in the city, the ones who were trusted by people in the city, and they sort of acted as the judge in a legal matter. Okay, so today we would go into a courtroom. If we really, really needed to deal with a legal matter, we might go into a courtroom and we might do our transaction in front of a judge, you know, wearing a black robe and the judge would sort of decide. And society has decided to put their trust in that judge, that that judge is going to make sure things happen fairly and according to law. And so that's what might happen today. Back then, all of these things were done in the gate of the city. It was sort of the, it, it wasn't the center of the city, but it was the center of city life. It was where everything happened within that city. So business was conducted at the city gate. And these were sort of these large structures. One of the things we've been able to do uh, archaeologically is we've been able to uncover a lot of city gates, uh, believe it or not, because the, they're, le they're usually left over in the archaeological remains. And scholars have been fascinated by how large these structures are. First of all, the city gate was to defend you from people coming in. But it wasn't just that. It was actually, these gates were oftentimes two stories tall, sometimes more than two stories tall. And inside of the city gates were all of these rooms. And during times of defense, the soldiers would garrison in these rooms and they would be ready at a moment's notice to go out and to attack the enemy or to defend themselves. But when soldiers were not needed in those rooms, these were the rooms where the business transactions would take place. So here they are at the city gate dealing with a sort of a business transaction. And as you're going to see in a minute here, this is very business-like. It's very, you know, how do we, you know, how do we solve this particular problem? So Boaz goes to the city gate and he begins looking for the man who is a close relative of Elimelech's family. So Boaz has an idea of who this guy is. And he all of a sudden sees this guy just happen to walk by at the particular moment that he's sitting there at the gate. Now, there's a funny sort of side note here that I want you to know about. In the ESV, it says that Boaz says to this guy, turn aside, friend. Do you guys see that there? Turn aside, friend. But here's what I can assure you, and scholars are very agreed upon. The Hebrew word is not friend. 
That is not what's happening here. So we don't know what this word exactly means. And so the best sort of guess that people have thrown at it is that he's, he's, he's using a word that you might use when you don't, when you forgot somebody's name and you're like, Hey, you, you know, Hey buddy. Hey guy. Hey, you know, whatever it is, you're using a word that masking the fact that you actually don't know who this is. In fact, the better translation might be Mr. So-and-so. Hey, 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 you, 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 come here. Basically that. He does not know his name or the narrator does not want to give his name. And I don't know which it is, but either way, there's sort of, there's a picture emerging here as we realize that Boaz has been named, but this other particular individual has not been named. So rather than friend, as if they're good buddies and hang out together, it's the word you use when you don't know somebody's name. Later in that story, this guy's going to be called the Redeemer, which is ironic because he's not going to redeem anything, as I'm about to, we're going to give away in just a second here. Let's keep reading. Let's look at the, this quote unquote Redeemer and see what he does. Then Boaz said to the Redeemer, this is verse three now, Naomi who has come back from the country of Moab is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not tell me that I may know for there is no one besides you to redeem it. And I come after you. And he, this is the redeemer. Now the guy says, I will redeem it. All right. Now let's pause right here in our story. And I want to, we need to get into the depths of Israelite law and society for a minute to understand exactly what just took place right here. Okay. This man, this guy who doesn't have a name has been presented with the field of a widow. Okay. What exactly does that mean? Naomi's the widow. Her husband used to have a field. His name was Elimelech. They left that field a long time ago, but he still has that field and it stays in his family. And now she sort of has, a, in a sense, has the field and she's offering the field. Okay. Now let's be very, very clear on what's happening here. Naomi isn't selling the field. Okay. Not in any of the sense that we would think of money exchanging hands. Let me give you money. You give me the field. That's not what's taking place here. The Hebrew word is a little bit difficult. It does not mean that this is a transaction. And the reason we know that's the case is because in Israel, fields were not acquired this way. You did not simply give up ownership of your field to another family or to even another distant family member. That's not the way things were done. It was very important in Israel that things stayed within the inheritance line, okay? So if you're a widow and you don't have children, this is a big problem here, okay? Because technically the field still belongs to your family line, but as of right now, you have no one for that field to actually go to. So let's, so let's back up and let's think what's going on here. This guy is not being offered to, hey, pay money and the field is yours. He's being offered the field in order to use it and even make profit off of it. In other words, he can sell what he makes from that field, but not for the field to actually belong to him and all of his descendants forever. This is very important. This is important for us to understand as far as what's about to happen in this story. The legal term, you don't have to remember this, but if any of you are lawyers or want to be lawyers or one day, it's called usufruct. And what usufruct means is it's you are agreeing to use the field and actually even improve the field, but it does not actually belong to you by title and deed. Okay. So Naomi has a field. She's saying, hey, does... Does one of my close family members want to use this field and actually start making a little bit of profit and money off of it? And Boaz is the one telling this guy. So this guy thinks to himself here, he says, okay, I'm going to get a field and I'm going to be able to use the field, but it's not technically my field. 
It technically belongs to the family line of Naomi. Oh, but wait a minute. Naomi is a widow without surviving children. That means that I can use this field, in quotes, forever. And there will never be a person who comes to actually take the field and say, it's mine by inheritance. It stays in my family. There will be no one because Naomi's already old enough to where she can't have kids. So, aha, this is a great deal for me. I can take this field. It's technically not mine, but it will be mine forever. Now, that's kind of a loophole, right? It's a loophole in the law. And this guy realizes that he's got this loophole, okay? So, so he's interested. Um, he's interested in it because her line is ultimately going to die out. So he thinks to himself, the land's technically not mine, but she can't have any more children. No one will be ever able to legally claim the land back from me. So this guy thinks he's being given a field of land for himself and for his family after him. And that's why he doesn't even have to think about it. He doesn't even, oh, I don't know. Let me, let me go all the way and think for a couple of days and come back and give you an answer. He's like, I'll take it. I'll take it right away. But as we are going to find out, this is not from any benefit to Naomi and certainly not any benefit to Ruth. This is a benefit for himself, okay? And I want you to notice, first of all, as our first point, if you're taking notes, the false redeemer is interested only in increasing his own estate, okay? That's, that's, that is what we're seeing in chapter four. We're first introduced to what I would call a false redeemer. And I want to pause for a minute here, and I just want to say to you guys as your pastor, beware of false redeemers. Beware of false redeemers in your life. What do I mean when I say a false redeemer? Well, a false redeemer would be someone or something that you think, if I put my trust completely in that person, if I lean on that person completely with my life and all that I am, then all's going to be well. Everything will be fine. This person is going to take care of me. This person's going to be everything that I need. Jesus teaches us about this, by the way, in John chapter 10. If you want to turn with me, John 10, 11 through 13, I'll also have it up on the board. Here's what Jesus says, comparing himself as the shepherd to another one that we might be tempted to think is our shepherd. Look at what he says here. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. What is Jesus doing here? And what's the application for us as we understand a text like this? I think it's this. There are idols out there in your life. There are all kinds of things you can put your trust in as a redeemer. And you'd be tempted to put your trust in them because they seem trustworthy. They seem like you could lean on them with all of your faith and hope and trust. It might be a person. It might be somebody in your life very close to you who you love and care for immensely. It might be your spouse. It might be your parents. It's someone in your life where you go, man, if I lean on them, they're never going to let me down ever. And if you have a good spouse, if you have good parents, maybe you have never experienced, maybe you've already been leaning on them all of your life and you've never actually experienced what Jesus is warning about here. But if you've ever had someone hurt you, if you've ever had someone truly hurt you that you have put your trust in, 
Jesus's words of warning become very clear. Which shepherd are you going to lean on? People will hurt you because no one will care for you, Jesus says, like Jesus will. That's what he says there. There is no other shepherd like me. There is no other good shepherd. There are hired hands that might at first look like shepherds, right? That's the point of a hired hand. He probably carries a staff around, you know, orders the sheep around, looks just like a shepherd, except you don't know that he's a hired hand until when? What does Jesus say? Until the wolf comes and he goes, I'm out of here. I'm not saving. I'm not going to put my life on the line to care for these sheep. I'm gone. And it's the moment of tribulation. It's the moment of difficulty. It's when the wolf comes. It's when Satan comes that you find out the truth that you've been leaning on the wrong shepherd the entire time. You lean on your boss at work. Okay, my boss is going to protect me until it's his skin versus your skin. Cut's got to be made somewhere. And he finds out that it's either he takes the hit in his job or else he passes it down the line to his sort of subordinate employees underneath him. And he's easily able to sacrifice you to save his own skin. Kids, students, those of you who are still in school, those of you who are in college, those of you who are just still at the point where you're sort of single and you're in that phase of life where you've just got tons of friends and friends are the most important thing, don't trust in your friends for your emotional needs to be met. They will not care for you the way Jesus does. What do we do instead? If we can't trust even our spouse whom we love, and by the way, I don't mean don't love your spouse. I mean that your spouse is not Jesus. I mean that your friends are not Jesus. Your boss is not Jesus. Your parents are not Jesus. These are people. These are people. And they might, they might emulate Jesus in a sacrificial loving kind of way. That's amazing when that happens. That's a gift when that happens. If you have parents that emulated Jesus in all that they did and all that they said, you are in rare air. You are, you, are, you are one of a very, very small percentage of people because as you look out upon the landscape, you will see all kinds of psychological trauma from family experiences. And even your spouse who might love Jesus and you, your spouse might be sitting next to you in this room, loving Jesus and listening to his word and, and hearing from him this moment. They are not a replacement redeemer in your life. They are not a savior in your life. And if you lean on them that way, you'll crush your marriage and you will be deeply disappointed. Jesus is teaching us that there are that human beings that are not Jesus are not a replacement for Jesus. There are false redeemers. They might be, they might be intending you harm and they might be a false redeemer in that sense. And they might be not intending you harm, but simply cannot bear up under the weight of you leaning on them because they're not the son of God. So be careful friends on who we lean on in this life, there are redeemers out there who are false. And we may, and probably many of you can testify to experiences in your life when you have leaned upon a person and put your full trust in a person only to have that person fail you. We could probably have deeply painful stories if we had time from people who could stand up here and testify to those stories. What do we do instead? What should we do? That's what not to do. What do we do? Well, here's what I think Jesus is getting at here with him saying he is the good shepherd. Cultivate a deep, abiding friendship with Jesus. 
cultivate a relationship with Jesus where he is your everything, where he is the one that you're desperate for, where he's the one that you're going to when things are truly at their worst and you're just crying out to him. I don't mean that you can't cry to your spouse or to your parents or to friends. I mean that they're not ultimately the ones that can solve it. They're not ultimately the ones that can bear up under that. Cry out to the one who can, to the one who has given his life that you would be redeemed from death. Cultivate a relationship with Christ. A friendship with him. A two-way conversation. Or you open up his word every morning and you're, you're seeing what he says to you and you're going to him in prayer and you're sharing your, the depths of your heart with him, he will not leave you. He will not forsake you. He will be a good shepherd for you. And he will stand in between you and the wolf, Satan himself. So that was our false redeemer. Let's get a picture now of the better redeemer in this story the one that's pointing to the best redeemer. Boaz is about to show that this guy's motivation is really faulty, is really not good. So notice that Boaz has withheld some information. He withheld some information in that that, that last verse there in verse three. And this guy jumped with his answer before hearing all the information. Piece of wisdom, everybody. Listen to all the information in a business transaction before you say anything. Because Boaz now adds some information into the mix. Now, why does that change this guy's answer? Well, let's get to that. Let's look at the verses. Then Boaz said, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth, the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. He sounds sort of very noble as he says that. I can't do it. Sorry. It's just not, it's not possible for me. So all of a sudden, this guy gets cold feet. What just happened? What new, what added into the equation that all of a sudden this guy gets cold feet? Now, remember that I said that this guy thought he was getting the field for free? He thought he was getting the field for free because he thought he was basically taking on the field of a widow who had no chance of having children. But what just got put into the equation? Boaz said that taking, that taking the field also came with it the daughter, the 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 wife of one of Elimelech's sons who died. Who is that? That's Ruth. By the way, Redeemer, if you take the field, you also have along with you the job of marrying the, 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 the wife of the son of Elimelech, if that makes sense. Family tree stuff here. Why? Why is that a problem now? Why is it a problem for this guy to do that? So now what this guy is doing is he's going he's gonna to have to put out a lot of money to provide for two new people in his house, basically. Not only that, what we, in order to really understand this, we have to understand something that we, we, we hit on last week, which is called leveret marriage. Leveret marriage. This is what leveret marriage is. It says in Deuteronomy 25 that if you're the brother or if you're – and I'm going to extend this now because apparently in Ruth, you could be a close family member and the same thing could happen. If you're a close family member and a a man dies leaving a widow, the idea is that you go and marry that widow to keep that man's name alive. And the way that it works is you go and marry that that woman – and you have a child with her and her first child that she has is not legally your child. I know this seems incredibly bizarre to us, 
But back then, remember, it was all about keeping the inheritance family line going so that you marry that woman. The first child you have, you're going to raise that child as a son or daughter. You're going to do all that you're going to do as a father to that child. However, that child does not bear your name. That child bears the name of the previously deceased husband, your brother or your close family member. And that child, most importantly, has all of the inheritance rights of that previously deceased husband. Why does that matter here? All of a sudden, this guy has to take a field. He has to provide a child for Ruth. Ruth's child grows up and he has to give the field back. And he goes, ah, now I'm calculating dollars and cents and putting things on the right and the left side of the ledger. And all of a sudden, nope, this does not work out lucratively for me. I don't get to give away an inheritance to my children of this field. I have to give it to a Limelex line. So no thank you. And so Boaz withheld that little piece of information. And Boaz, I believe, had the intention of throwing that piece of information here to show this man's heart for what it really was. Oh, I get a field for free? Great, I'll take it. Oh, I get a field where I actually have to provide for these other women? No thanks. So his answer ultimately is no. Now, some of you might say, well, why can't he just take the field and not marry Ruth? He can, except that cultural pressure was so intense at that time that he actually would have been shamed if he didn't do so. There is this story in the Leveret marriage, Deuteronomy 25, where if a man decides, if a brother of a man who died decides not to actually marry the widow of the brother, there's this ritual that takes place. It's very interesting. The widow in a legal setting with all the elders of the city and all the people gathered around takes, she is to take the sandal off the man's foot. Imagine this. Everybody's watching. She takes the sandal off the man's foot and she slaps him with the sandal and spits in his face. This is Deuteronomy 25 commanding her to do this. And that man is forever to be known as the man who would not redeem his brother. Forever. Talk about shame and guilt being used here. This is the law of God declaring shame upon a person who does not act appropriately in this way. So for him to say, I'll take the field, but I will not redeem Ruth, there would be some kind of equivalent thing taking place here. He'd probably get slapped with a sandal. Nobody wants to get slapped with a sandal. Those things are nasty, right? So he, t he decides, I'm just going to completely, completely avoid this whole thing. Now let's continue. Let's continue looking on, reading on in our, in our text. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Chilion and to Mahlon. Those are his sons, by the way. Also Ruth the Moabite the widow of Mahlon, I have bought to be my wife, to perpetuate the name of the dead inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elders said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. Now, if you're not real familiar with the Bible, by the way, those are all Bible stories that you can read back in the book of Genesis, okay? So they're just bringing up lots of the people of the past who were blessed by God and saying, may you be blessed like they were blessed. So Boaz decides to do the very thing that Mr. So-and-so, the false redeemer, refused to do. He took the financial hit 
to provide for Ruth and Naomi. He acquired Elimelech's field and intended to have a child with Ruth who would legally be in Elimelech's family, meaning that Boaz was giving that field right back as soon as they had a child who would come of age. So here's point number two, if you're taking notes. And remember, we're comparing the false redeemer now. Here's number two, Boaz, the true redeemer, selflessly restores the line of Elimelech and brings Ruth and Naomi into the blessing of his house. He selflessly restores the line of Elimelech compared to the false redeemer's thoughts only about himself. We have a few happily ever after verses that follow here. Everything has been resolved. There's great joy for all the characters involved. And we learn in these final verses that Ruth and Boaz have a son. Okay, so we're going to see that. If you just look down, I'm not going to read the entire thing. But if you look down, starting at verse 13, you can read it that they have a son together. And the focus of the story now comes back to Naomi. This is interesting. Back to Naomi, who, who's really been the focus at the beginning of the story, and then she was the focus at the end of the story, but Ruth was in the middle of the story. And here's what it says in Ruth 4, 17. Follow along with me. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, a son has been born to Naomi. Now, make no mistake, Boaz married Ruth, okay? But the women are saying, a son has now been born to Naomi, very interesting. That's how important that line was. Naomi now has a son because her daughter-in-law has a son. He's continuing that family line, okay? A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. We're meant to consider Naomi here at the end of the story. The author has brought Naomi back into the picture, and we are meant to really now think carefully about Naomi and about what she is and who she is here, especially in light of something Naomi said in chapter one. So we're supposed to look at chapter four, look back at chapter one, the last time we really saw Naomi talking, and we're supposed to see the difference here. Look back with me to Ruth 1, 20 and 21. Naomi says, she said to them, do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? Or you feel like God is bringing calamity upon you? Back in chapter one, Naomi didn't understand why any of this stuff had to happen to her. She couldn't see what was going on in any sense. He just saw bad after bad after bad. Famine in Israel, we go to Moab. As soon as we go to Moab, my husband dies. After my husband dies, my sons marry, but then my sons die. I've lost everything in my life, and I feel like God is the one who brought this upon me. And that's what she says. Openly and boldly to everyone that's around her, that's listening to her, my life is bitter, she says. Call me Mara, and the Lord is the one who's done this to me. I wonder if you feel, if any of you feel in this moment, bitterness towards God, a sense in which God has brought on a calamity upon me as if he doesn't love me, as if he's not acting towards me in a good way. I know certain theological truths that are somehow out there floating, but I don't, I don't actually know how they apply into my situation of God's goodness and his mercy and his tender care for me. I don't feel it right now. I wonder if there's anyone listening to my voice that would just say, that's me right now in this moment. And you know, bitterness comes in a lot of different forms. Sometimes bitterness comes in the form of just raw anger. This is Naomi, right? Naomi's just spewing. It's coming out of her mouth. Everybody knows it. She's just spewing out. That's one way. 
That might be you. There, there are some people that that's how they sort of let out their bitterness and their anger. But sometimes bitterness takes a different form. Sometimes bitterness comes actually in the form of anxiety and depression. It actually saddens you and takes you internal with your feelings rather than letting your feelings out in an expressive way. You internalize them and all of a sudden you begin to feel, why do I do anything if God is just going to be against me? Why do anything? Why act at all? Why take, why, why move at all in this life? And all of a sudden, you can't find motivation. Anybody been there? This one, I think, is far more common. You know why? Because you're not actively out there raging against God. You're not actively, you know, if you do that, people are going to come to you. They're going to be, let's pray for you. Let's care for you. Let's, but you, let's be honest, our hearts don't actually want that. We don't want to look like we're upset with God. We don't want to look like we're bitter towards him. So we internalize it all because that's the more holy thing to do, right? And so what Ruth is telling us as we finish this book is number one, God is using desperate circumstances to bring you back to him. Friends, we do not cry out to him when things are good. Anybody else testify to that? Because I, as your pastor, am going to be the first to raise my hand and say that I do not cry out to God when things are good. I don't. I wish that I did because then things wouldn't have to be desperate. They wouldn't have to be at a place where, where God is bringing me to that place. But my heart doesn't want to cry out to him when things are good. I'm, I'm like what we've seen in the nation of Israel. Whenever God restores them back in the story of the judges, whenever God brings them back to just peace and happiness, what happens? They turn away from God. I have a little bit of that in my heart. I have a sense of, yeah, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Everything's good. I'm going to rely again on my own resources rather than trust in the Lord. But God loves us. Listen, if you're bitter this morning, I need you to hear me loud and clear. The Lord loves you and wants you to trust in him more than you trust in your own resources, more than you trust in your own ability to sort of just carry on. He wants your desperation towards him. And he loves you enough to where he would bring something into your life that would actually cause that desperation. And let me say it another way. Woe to you if you've never had this happen in your life. And what I mean by that is be very, very, very careful to know whether you are actually one of God's children if you have never had this happen in your life. If you live in luxury without a care and a problem in the world, you should be very, very scared. Because there's two things that the Bible tells us that God does with his children. Number one, he disciplines his children. The author of Hebrews tells us, if you aren't being disciplined by God, you're not one of his children. The, the, the Lord disciplines his own sons and his own daughters. Number two, rather than discipline and being something that, you know, in response to a sin that you committed, God will just bring into your life affliction and difficulties and even persecution for the same response. God, I need you. I'm desperate for you because he loves you. And I hope you'll see that this morning. Out of his deep love for you, you will have things happen in your life. Count on it. But number two, and this is the other thing we need to keep in mind, God is working a global plan for good, for our good, that's bigger than our individual moment of pain. 
the way in which God governs this world is to bring about his glory in the world and the good of all of those who love him. How do I know that? Can I just make that claim? I can't just make that claim. The Bible has made that claim. Romans chapter eight, and God works all things together for good for those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. That's you. He's working all things for your good. Even your pain, even the afflictions and the things that you bear and suffer and the difficulties that you have, you can't see it yet. You're like Naomi in chapter one right now. You don't know the end of the story. You don't know what's going on. But if we get to the chapter four of your life, you will come to a place where you will look back and go, I have immense blessings from God. And friend, I'm going to be honest with you. That might be your death when you look back upon all of your life. That might be when you stand before God and you hear, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into my peace when you finally get relief from whatever it is that's ailing you. We don't preach a health and wealth gospel here. I don't know that you will be healed from your malady. I don't know that the situation that is just torturing your soul will be done away with. Here's what I do know. If you're a Christian, it is working for your good. And I'm calling upon us as a church to trust in that, to set aside the bitterness and to trust that we have a redeemer, a better redeemer than Boaz even, one who is our true shepherd, one in whom has laid down his life for his sheep, for you. And that's what the ending of Ruth is meant to show us. Just the last few verses here. Now, these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Aminadab. Aminadab fathered Nashon. Nashon fathered Sam, Salmon. Salmon fathered Boaz. And Boaz fathered Obed. Obed fathered Jesse. And Jesse fathered David. What's the Bible telling us by adding a genealogy at the end of this story? The Bible is telling us that the Davidic line has continued through these circumstances. Through all of that pain and all of that is going on, God is ensuring a line of his people that's going to terminate and end in Jesus Christ being born. In the line of David, the son of David. And he will die upon a cross that the gospel can go out to the entire world and that salvation can come to many who are his people. And so in some sense, the salvation that you experience right now has a cause, which has another cause, which has another cause. And there's this chain of causes that goes all the way back to the story of Ruth so that God could work his plan exactly as he wanted his plan to be so that his son would be born, would die upon a cross, would raise again from the dead, and that the call would go out that all would believe in him. And that's where we find ourselves. And there is good being worked in this story. And so I want to pray for us, especially for those this morning that would say, I've got bitterness in my heart towards God because of something that has happened, because of something that's currently happening to you. And that you would hear that the Lord loves you personally and means good for you personally. And that he's working a global plan to bring his gospel and even utilizing the afflictions and the difficulties of, the, of this life in order to make that plan happen. And that we would trust both of those things to be true this morning. Let's pray. Lord, we ask now that you would... By your Holy Spirit, instill into us a desperation for you. Lord, would you forgive us if we have lived in our own strength and in the bitterness of our own souls saying, why are these things happening to me? Would you forgive us if we have trusted in false redeemers 
who have let us down and failed us. God, would you help us to put our full trust in you, not only our redeemer, but our shepherd, the one who lays his life down for his sheep. And I pray God that we would come again to you with boldness and with love in our hearts to say, I'm putting my full trust in you again, Jesus. And I pray God, you would help us to understand that your working in this world is often mysterious. And yet we know from your word that you are working good for us and for your glory. So help us Lord, help us and be with us and meet us in our pain right now in this moment. We pray this in Jesus' name.